proceed with the next paper by Dr. Hervé Joseline. Hervé Joseline is a lecturer in, of history in the Department of Turkish and Asian uh, Studies in the National University of Athens. Among others, his book in French about uh, Smyrna was translated into Greek with the title Smyrna, Abdul Cosmopolitismo, Eosophicismus. He will talk about the past sensitive period for Smyrna in the wartime end of October 1914 to September 8, 1922. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Um, I would like first to thank the organizers for the smooth proceeding and for the friendly climate we are enjoying uh, these two days. So I would like it to work. So. <laughs> Smyrna on the eve of, the, of World War I was still a major port for the diminished Ottoman Empire. It had turned in 1913 into a frontier city since the Aegean Islands had been conquered by neighboring Greece, which achieved a spectacular territorial increase. Smyrna was suddenly a major Greek-speaking urban center, but it was more of something it was more or something different than that. It did not match with the standards of any homogeneous national state as the canons of any contemporary nationalism define it. The city population was diverse as any book or publication or diplomatic dispatch on the city imply confer. But even more important, its activities and cultural life were not centered on any national exclusive identity. The importance of Smyrna within the Ottoman Empire relied on the fact that its economic ties defined the narrow national logics of Greece or modern Turkey, but rather established uh, trade and larger economic dependencies, which had an early global range, linking the Eastern Mediterranean and Asia Minor with Africa, Western Europe, North America, and even other places around the world. In this paper, I will try to describe the inadequate nature of Smyrna according to national canons, that is, the Levantine character of the city. Then we will review the strangely protected situation of Smyrna until 1918, when history seemed to largely spare it, though it was vulnerable. Um, the period between November 1918 and September 1922 was then a time of condensed changes which did not allow Smyrna to reach a new equilibrium but brought about its destruction by the military victors. <coughs> the, well, this, I wanted to be synthetic. So you, you had uh, everything in Smyrna. Some, someone said uh, this morning that uh, there were many uh, cities uh, in Smyrna, that was uh, Achilles, and I think these two postcards um, does, do prove uh, this uh, reality. Um, Smyrna was a dynamic kaleidoscope since the 16th, early uh, 17th century. Although the city had lost most of its population and its economic significance after the demise of the Byzantine rule, until the firm establishment of the Ottoman one. So, if I may disagree with uh, Alexandros Kitroev, it only regained these, but expanded. It not only regained these, but expanded uh, to a, become a major port city of the Nigerian part of the Ottoman Empire. This was achieved thanks to immigration from the Aegean archipelago, um, from Western Europe or from the Ottoman inner lands, the former being suddenly prevalent. In the 19th century, Smyrna appeared to Western travelers, but also to Ottoman observers, as the infidel city, uh, Yavur Izmir, was suddenly the product of a local, urban, and economic growth integrated in the Ottoman matrix even more than Alexandria. 
um, I'm referring to the municipality, which uh, institutionalized in Alexandria this uh, status of uh, extraterritoriality. We have nothing similar uh, in, in Smyrna. Still, Smyrna's population was flamboyantly diverse and more strikingly in comparison with Ottoman cities in the interior of the empire. Non-Muslims were a majority in the urban population, most probably Orthodox, both Ottoman subjects and nationals of the Kingdom of Greece, outnumbers all others in Smyrna. But communities originally from Western Europe, Italy, France, the Netherlands, Germany and Great Britain were also present. Moreover, there was a troubling cultural continuity with Western Europe in this Asian city, to such an extent that a French consul Consul, intentionally or not, named the place where he was posted a European city. The number of uh, Westerners in the city was limited in comparison with these of the Orthodox Christians and the Sunni Muslims. Um, so this um, this is documented by our a German uh, diplomatic dispatch. Um, the real provenience of these people may also have been more complicated than their asserted official nationality. Intermarriages and naturalization had a significant role. The Supreme Court recognized the embassies and consulates' protégés, who then could become foreign subjects. The Italians and the French could claim to have a long-term presence in the region since the Crusades or the Byzantine times. These discourses did not need to be much coherent with reality. Catholicism in the city was a major social factor in terms of churches, charities, and even more visible and socially relevant in terms of educational opportunities. The most prestigious schools in Smyrna have long been Catholic ones teaching in French. The relatively new uh, established Italian state was a newcomer in the search for influence in the Eastern Mediterranean basin and was trying to imitate, if not surpass, um, the French policy of instrumentalizing the Catholic educational network to their own benefit. The local French language press was manifold and had the possibility to be read by people with different ethnic and religious, religious backgrounds. It was a major presence in the visual urban landscape, uh, thanks to signs in this language in the Fran Frankish quarter, in the new quarter behind the quay, the keys, as uh, we were talked, to, uh, talked about today, but also in many shops across the city. Everyone was aware that French was the key to progress. This was particularly true since France was then a major scientific, cultural, and political pole on its own. But it was also a self-fulfilling prophecy, which sufficed to maintain the status of semi-official language in many institutions of the Ottoman Empire. For instance, uh, the Ottoman Bank, um, the Ottoman Bank used to work in French, and that of learned lingua franca in Smyrna, although vernacular Greek was certainly for more informal occasions, the more spontaneous ideal cross crossing the boundaries across most communities. This symbolic and practical hierarchy would be put in question already after 1913 and after 1918, when English started to replace French in international affairs, but more pertinent on the spot when Turkish nationalism first incarnated by the Committee Union and Progress and afterward by the Kemalist movement, targeted both Greek and French, which um, should be erased in favor of the use of Turkish, uh, the exclusive use of Turkish in the public sphere. The language question would be solved by the massive change of population following the destruction of the city in September 1922. The English-speaking community in Smyrna did exist, of course. It was itself a diverse group. Trade did play an important role, Great Britain being the main capitalist economy and industrial center without competitor in the first half of the 19th century. Import of know-how necessary for the development of railways departing from Smyrna towards the interland 
implied the settlement in Smyrna of professionals for some time or definitely. Protestantism was certainly a main marker in the English-speaking population, though not exclusive. One has to keep in mind that Smyrna was the first base of activities of the Bible Society in the Ottoman Empire. There were major American schools in Smyrna before World War I, working at the westernmost base of a whole network which was especially dense and successful in Central and Eastern Asian Turkey. Smyrna was a major center of diplomatic contacts between the Ottoman Empire and Western states. The Levantine populations were monitored by their respective consul. Diplomatic dispatches give a probably exaggerated picture of the centrality of the consul in each Levantine community with regular meetings and various social gatherings. The consulates were duplicating the social life of the bourgeoisie in Great Britain or France on the Aegean shores, imitating moors and ways as they were supposedly the norm in the homeland. There was a semi-colonial dimension of this intense social life. As far as the French case is concerned, there was limited intermingling with Muslim Turks in French clubs or at the Alliance Francaise, for instance. The presence of locals was restricted to that of non-Muslims, but no prohibition or formal segregation was ever publicly uh, said. Challenging the status quo. This status quo was put in question by the coup in 1913 and suddenly with, with regained intensity in the years of World War I. The local governor, Rani Bey, was originally from Salonika, um, which became a good city in 1912. He was an early member of the Committee of Union and Progress. The Austro Hungarian Consul, Vladimir Radinsky, insists that the Kbali was among the founding members and the founding providers of the CUP in Salonika. Rani Bey believed in the possibility of an autonomous modernization with less participation of non Turks or more discretion on the part of Western countries or their nationals in the Ottoman domains who are used to regularly uh, infringe on the Ottoman sovereignty. The Austro Hungarian cons Consul described the new governor as chauvinistic. Even the allies of the Ottoman Empire had limited sympathy for his personality. Possibly their status as European powers, convinced of their own advancement, prevented them from deeming legitimate the political decisions in the empire. Rani Bey, who know how, know how to control the Smyrna-based press, putting pressure, for instance, on the editor-in-chief of Smyrna's leading French newspaper, La Reforme, so that his alleged impartiality towards non-Muslim city dwellers, and especially in times, be praised. Rami Bey usually got satisfaction, hoping that a self-tailored public image would protect him after the war. Quite possibly, Rami Bey envisioned that the empire could lose the war and acted accordingly towards the nationals of the alliance powers. The British archives reveal that British subjects were especially spared by the valley. Smyrna was radically affected by the war, though it was not a place of military operations itself. The main change was the decision by the Ottoman authorities to close the port to navigation, mining the Gulf of Smyrna. The decision protected the city from the Ottoman point of view, from a hostile landing, but it also cut it off from the outside world, while the very, the very raison d'etre of Smyrna was its maritime trade with other ports all over the world. The British diplomacy, as any similar service in other alliance powers, was forced to accept the fait accompli. The British subjects remaining in Smyrna were to be protected by the diplomats of the United States until the latter could declare war to Imperial Germany in 1917. Allies nationals were prevented from leaving the city, staying behind and remaining at the mercy of the local authorities. Rani Bey knew that he thus had a trunk in his hands and took care of his assets. 
He also diligently let know that he intended, intended to protect allies nationals to the various ministries of foreign affairs. Rani Bey was tempted during the conflict to establish some links with the potential victors in case the central empires were to be defeated. The Levantine logics of changing or acquiring nationality went on in the war time, and some British subjects could become US citizens and then be allowed to travel or establish links with the outside world with limited control. The British diplomacy knew about such cases and used them in order to keep in touch with the reality in Smyrna. It was most crucial for Levantine businessmen to be able, if not to conduct business as usual, at least to keep ties with the outside world, maintain whatever activity was to be saved and anticipate the post-war period under better auspices. A male member of the family Missir, a Levantine of Syrian origins, permitted to James Becker, a prominent trader in Smyrna, who was in Britain, when war was declared, to maintain contacts with his assets. According to British archival documents, the Foreign Office was in touch with Rani Bay, thanks to such individuals, allowed <coughs> to come to England after their naturalisation. It may have occurred that Rani Bay thought that after defect defecting to the Alliance and handing over his city to the British, if granted a reward, he was ready to, to do that. The good treatment enjoyed by the British nationals in Smyrna is clearly used in the dispatches to impress the British authorities so that they trust um, the potential partner. There is no moral judgment in the documents. British diplomats and their correspondents in the milieu of business seem to have considered this defection as a practical possibility. The main reasons why the offer was rejected, which readers can trace, were the relative unreliability of Messier as a messenger and the too high amount of Rami Bay's pretensions as a financial compensation. Rami Bay is portrayed as being culturally and by personal taste more inclined to have relations with the British than to support the Ottoman alliance with Germany, which is possible. The document sheds light on the possibility of a British landing in Western Ottoman Asia Minor. <coughs> but the uh, British authorities were not interested in opening a second front. Obviously, the Levantines in Vienna were not targeted by the Ottoman violence, which, however, concerned the Greek Orthodox population and uh, the Armenian one. Smyrna was bombed a few times in the conflict, but though terrifying as the experience might have been, the destructions and casualties were minimal. Smyrna was no place of military operations compared to the Caucasus and Ottoman Armenia and Eastern Asia Minor, the Dardanelles, Greater Syria or Iraq. On the whole, it was certainly a privilege to be a resident of a city during the conflict, especially as a national of a foreign country, despite the unpleasant context and the food shortages. Levantines in the post-war turmoil. The defeat of the Ottoman Empire and the uncertainty that followed were no appeasement for the Levantines in Smyrna. Dependent on the status of semi-colonial port, the elite of these colonies did take part as far as possible and probably at a level with no proportion with their demographic importance, but adequate to their economic assets and commercial know-how in the political negotiation negotiations at least within the ministries of foreign affairs and at the peace conference in Versailles. The Levantines did not share the Greeks' outbursts of enthusiasm about plans of unification with Greece. The perspective of prolonged Ottoman rule was rather unrealistic. The defeated empire had lost legitimacy. In fact, even if this idea seems odd today, Levantine circles favoured an extension of colonial rule in Smyrna. It's, it, it seemed to be a rational and civilised perspective at that time. After all, all the domains of the Ottoman Empire were being divided among the victors, France and Great Britain, within the frame of the newly founded League of Nations. The main question was which state was the most adequate 
to the regular functioning of the Levantine world. Preferences went to Britain or France. Italy could be a possibility, but Greece was not deemed a satisfactory pretender. So, this is, um, this is a document about um, the Hellenic administration in Smyrna. This proves uh, that, uh, obviously, the local Levantines uh, were not happy about uh, the landing of the new administration, while, of course, uh, the Greek Orthodox population was uh, extremely happy about it, and uh, the Orthodox Archbishop Chrysostomos even spoke about uh, the fulfillment of times with this landing. So I'm skipping some pieces and I'm almost done. <clears throat> Famous names of the British Levantine colony, such as Forbes, were reporting worries about the final peace settlement, though using arguments which completed a gloomy picture of the situation. Quote, under these circumstances, I see little hope for this part of the world returning to pre-war conditions. On the contrary, the occupation of Smyrna has simply resulted in creating a new condition of Balkan anarchy throughout Asia Minor. If the province of Smyrna should be annexed to Greece, but all the Greeks here firmly stay will be the case, then without doubt we are in for a long period of grave, dis grave disorders, and sooner or later, it may be at an early date, the Turks will succeed in arming themselves to a degree that will enable them to drive the Greeks out of this country." End of quote. David Forbes advocated a semi-colonial rule and would, according to his Levantine vision, which would, according to his uh, Levantine vision, guarantee the safety of the Greek residents and respect the feelings of the Turks, while permitting the return of normalcy of trade and other economic activities which were his main pragmatic concerns. I'm almost done. The conquest of Smyrna in September 1922 by the nationalist forces did not bring the restoration of the good old times. In fact, the Hellenic administration was certainly the most privileged time of Christians in Smyrna. So this is um so oh. <laughs> You have your piece of French. <laughs> so, the interesting side of uh, the just interesting aspect of this document is that the consul, the French consul, is very aware, aware after the uh, destruction by the fire that uh, an era has, came, has come to an end. So this is a picture of the, of the fire, which you may have seen. It was uh, taken from uh, an Italian ship. Um, this is a map of uh, the destructions uh, in the city, um, as published uh, uh, in September 1922 uh, uh, in the Times. The arson that destroyed the heart of the city did not stop by wonder in front of the Levantine's uh, properties. Kissing a western flag on the facade or on the top of one's house or any institution did not protect anyone. This was a cultural shock for those who experienced this second de facto abolishment of the capitulations by the fledgling new regime. It should be reminded that the Gulf of Smyrna was full of warships and merchant ships before the city was conquered and that the consulates of the alliance did evacuate their nationals before the city was destroyed. Casualties among British and French subjects were minimal. There certainly was acute awareness of the danger. The person who could not get an early passage on such vessels were therefore trapped in the city, that is, local inhabitants deprived of connections with the alliance powers. The destruction of businesses and properties in the center of the city triggered off a massive departure of Levantines from Smyrna from Smyrna too, about to become exclusive Izmir. Of course, as in any similar situation, there was no perfect tabula rasa, 
and some of it remain in the city. Some places have not been destroyed, for instance, Kashiyaka, Kodeyo, Bornova, Bucha. When Kant surmised that Levantines who would remain in Smyrna after the fire, if, would remain in, in Smyrna after the fire if their assets were escaped the destruction, of, or if they had really no means to consider emigration to Western Europe. The French consul who tried to reorganize the consular services in Izmir after the destruction was well aware that an era had finished and that the former network of the French consulate would never be as powerful. And I have a small epilogue, after the epilogue, um, about the situation of the Levantines today in Izmir. So we are down from several uh, thousand people um, at the beginning of the 20th century to some um, 500 people, probably, uh, in Smyrna today, in a city uh, which has uh, expanded largely to four uh, million inhabitants. Um, their role, their social role today, uh, as a very uh, small community, is uh, very limited. Uh, they have um, no, um, no say uh, in the major cultural trends of Turkey, for sure. Um, they are very active, though, on the uh, associative and cultural level. And this uh, conference may be, part, may be considered as a part of uh, this dynamics. And I will end this uh, presentation with a quote by um, Andrew Silas, uh, whom some of you uh, may know. Uh, well, the Levantines are not able to respect rules of endogamy and therefore they are doomed to disappear. Um, but their memory can remain alive. Thank you for your attention.